slanted slope and inclined towards seclusion. Thus, it is impossible that he will return to the lower life. And how monks thus a monk develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path? Here monks, a monk develops right view, right thoughts, right speech, etc. up to right concentration, which are based upon seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing in release. It is in this way, monks, that a monk develops and cultivates the Noble Eightfold Path. Let's see another sutta. Mm. So, the Buddha says, uh, if a monk uh, really practices the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, then uh, uh, his mind uh, inclines towards seclusion. Uh, it can be that he might want to stay alone, or even if he stays with others, uh, then uh, he is aloof. Uh, it's a loo from other side, it doesn't go into people's kuti and chat and chat and all that. Uh, so, uh, if, he, if he practices seclusion for a long time, then uh, uh, he wants to be alone. Then he will not want to disrobe and go back to society. When you go back to society, uh, you have to mix with a lot of people. When you mix with a lot of people, uh, your mind uh, is always uh, scattered. The next sutta is 45.175, page 1564. The Buddha said, Monks, there are these seven underlying tendencies. What seven? The underlying tendency to sensual lust, the underlying tendency to aversion, the underlying tendency to views, the underlying tendency to doubt, the underlying tendency to conceit, the underlying tendency to lust for existence, the underlying tendency to ignorance. These are the seven underlying tendencies. This noble eightfold path is to develop for direct knowledge of these seven underlying tendencies, for the full understanding of them, for their utter destruction, for, the, uh, for their abandoning. Mm. So these are the underlying tendencies uh, within each, each person. The tendency to lust, to aversion, uh, to views, to doubt, to conceit, to lust for existence, to ignorance. Mm. The next sutta is 45.177. Monks, there are these five hindrances, pancha nivarana. What five? The hindrance of sensual desire, the hindrance of ill will or anger, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, the hindrance of restlessness and remorse, the hindrance of doubt. These are the five hindrances. This noble eightfold path is to, is to be developed for direct knowledge of these five hindrances, for the full understanding of them, for their utter destruction, for their abandoning. Mm. These five hindrances uh, are five things uh, that obstruct us uh, from seeing clearly. Uh. So they are the cause uh, of our being very bodo bodo uh, and blur blur. Uh. Uh, so when we practice meditation, uh, and when uh, the mind becomes focused, uh, and then these five uh, melt away. Uh, uh, there's a lot uh, about these five hindrances uh, in the chapter on the seven bojanga, uh, because they are the opposite of the seven bojanga. Seven bojanga uh, bring you to enlightenment. Uh, uh, these five hindrances uh, bring you away from enlightenment. Uh, that's why when we meditate, uh, the most important aim of meditation uh, is to get rid of the five hindrances. When the five hindrances are got rid of, uh, then only uh, wisdom can arise. Uh. Mm. The next uh, sutta is 45.179. Monks, there are these five lower factors, Sangyojana. What five? Identity view, Sakaya Ditti, uh, doubt the distorted grasp of rules and vows, Hilabhata Paramasa, sensual desire, ill will, these are the five lower factors. 
This noble eightfold path is to, de- is to be developed for direct knowledge of these five lower factors, for the full understanding of them, for their destruction, for their abandoning. Mm. These five lower factors, uh, when a person attains sotapanna, the first fruit, uh, first, first fruit of Aryahood, uh, uh, the, the first three uh, are eliminated, uh, identity, view, doubt, and uh, attachment to rules and vows. Uh, mm. And then when a person attains anagam, uh, when a person attains uh, sakadagamin, the second fruit, uh, then uh, sensual desire and ill will uh, are weakened. Uh, and then when one attains anagamin, uh, Sensual desire and ill will are eliminated uh, so that all the five lower factors are eliminated uh, for an anagamin. Uh. This identity view is to identify oneself uh, with the body and the mind. Uh. Doubt is doubt about the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, uh, not having faith. Uh. Mm. And then this uh, attachment to rules and rituals uh, or uh, rules and vows uh, uh, means uh, uh, cling to these rules and vows, uh, not understanding uh, that uh, they are only meant for a purpose. Uh. The next sutta, 45.180. Monks, there are these five higher factors. What five? Lust for form, lust for the formless, conceit, restlessness, ignorance. These are the five higher factors. The Noble Eightfold Path is to, is to be developed for direct knowledge of these five higher factors for the full understanding of them, for their utter destruction, for their abandoning. What noble eightfold path? Here monks, a monk develops right view, right thoughts, right speech, etc. up to right concentration, which are based upon seclusion, dispassion and cessation, maturing in release. This noble eightfold path is to be developed for direct knowledge of these five higher factors, for the full understanding of them, for their utter destruction, for their abandoning. I don't know why they, they repeat. No? So, uh, these five higher factors, uh, what are they? The first one uh, is uh, lust for form. Actually, it means uh, attachment uh, to be reborn in the form realm. Uh, the desire uh, to be reborn in the jhana planes, uh, the form realm. Then the second one is the desire to be reborn in the formless realm. That means the realm of the Arupa Jhanas. The conceit is the I am, that, that feeling, that perception within us, that I exist. And restlessness is another one. Ignorance is another one. Ignorance of the Noble Eightfold Path. So, um, Sorry, ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. Uh, mm. So, when a person destroys the five higher factors, uh, uh, only uh, he attains arahanhood. Uh, uh, arahan uh, destroys the five higher factors. Uh, mm. So you see how these five higher factors, uh, ignorance, uh, uh, ignorance is only destroyed by an arahan. Uh, even an anagamin uh, has not destroyed ignorance, still has a bit of ignorance. Uh, and restlessness also. Restlessness, uh, uh, only the arahan uh, is totally uh, cool. The arahan is totally cool. Uh, there's no more restlessness. Uh. And then the, the conceit, uh, I exist. Uh, uh, only the arahan uh, has eliminated that. Uh. So when the arahan eliminates all this, uh, he stands way above all the other, other others uh, in the world. Mm. That's the end of that chapter, huh? 45. Mm. Maybe we go into the Bojangas tomorrow. Huh? They're quite heavy, heavy going. Huh? Anything to discuss?
Or shall we stop here? Mm. That that one so I uh, no that one sila bata paramasa clinging to rules and rituals or clinging to rules and vows lah. Uh, aspiration uh, is to uh, aspire to something lah to make a wish uh, to attain something lah. Uh, but uh, making a vow uh, is uh, actually not very practical. Uh. Uh, a lot of people think uh, that you make a vow, you make a vow to be reborn in the pure land, or you make a vow to bring beings to the pure land, and all this. Uh, uh, I guess to most people's mind, uh, it's like a stronger aspiration uh, because it is a vow. Uh. It's like a do or die thing. Uh, it must succeed. Uh. But uh, I think the Buddha says uh, that what we want in the world uh, cannot be achieved by prayers, cannot be achieved by making vows, cannot be achieved by thinking of them every day. We have to do the practical work uh, of uh, working towards what we want. Uh. And uh, that working towards what we want, uh, walking to where we want to go, uh, you must walk in the right direction, uh, as I mentioned just now. If you grind sand uh, hoping to get oil, you'll never uh, get oil uh, until you die. Uh. Uh, so uh, making vows by themselves uh, is pointless uh, in the Buddha's uh, Dhamma, since the Buddha says, uh, you're not going to get what you want by making vows. So, making aspiration also, uh, in a way also, is uh, useless. Uh, unless uh, it is backed up uh, by the effort. Uh, that's why the Buddha says, of all wholesome states, uh, diligence, uh, energetic effort uh, is, the more, is the chief, uh, is the most important. So whatever we want to, make, to, to, to achieve, uh, no need to... Uh, make a vow. Lah. We just uh, aspire to achieve what we want and then forget about the aspiration and just do the work. Lah. Uh, uh. If you put all your attention lah, in working for what you want to get, lah, then you will definitely get it. Lah. I think I remember reading somewhere yeah, where the, I think the Buddha said lah, that if a person is mind is uh, the t- determination is very strong, uh, then even the deva also cannot obstruct you. Uh. So like for example, the Buddha's determination uh, to become enlightened uh, was so strong uh, that he worked so hard for it. Uh. Even Mara wants to obstruct him uh, from becoming enlightened. Uh. Mara also is unable to obstruct him. So it depends on whose will is stronger. Uh. Uh, yes, la. Uh, but uh, it's it's a it's it's a wrong view, la. Many years ago, uh, uh, we had a Malaysian monk uh, who was telling people that when you do dana, when you do charity, when you make offerings, uh, you should make a vow. May the merit of this uh, charity uh, uh, enable me to uh, uh, to obtain this and obtain that, uh, or be released from samsara and all that. Uh. But in the Buddha's teachings, uh, this kind of vow uh, is useless. Uh, in fact, in the suttas, the Buddha says uh, it has the opposite effect. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is. Uh, actually uh, lessen uh, the merit of your dana. If you do charity uh, with uh, 
uh, aim uh, or a motive uh, to attain something, uh, that means you have a